bald eagles, sea turtles, saw some gopher tortoise holes, deer, bobcats. There were piping plovers at snakes, multiple kinds of snakes. There were spectacular sunsets, sunrises. I mean, the weather was just fantastic. Dragonflies. So many dragonflies. Thousands. (laughs) uh, You know, these swallow murmurations over the dunes were fantastic to witness. And there were even shooting stars. Hey listeners, with the holiday season upon us, make your gift giving both easier and more eco-friendly by shopping with our partner, Wendy Barnes Design. Wendy Barnes collaborates with conservation organizations across the globe to create reusable and sustainable products. When you shop the Wild Cumberland Collection, we receive a portion of the proceeds from each sale to go towards our mission of protecting Cumberland Island. So check out wendybarnesdesign.com today and make your holidays better for your loved ones and the planet. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Jessica, Executive Director of Wild Cumberland. And I'm Devin, a Wild Cumberland volunteer. We appreciate you being here. We start every single podcast episode with the same reminder. Our monthly email newsletter is the very best way to stay up to date on issues affecting Cumberland Island and its wilderness. So if you haven't already, check out our website, wildcumberland.org, and get yourself signed up. In today's episode, we're recapping our recent trip to the seashore, It's indefinite wilderness closure, and as always, we're going to cover some local and national wilderness news. Yeah, first and foremost, though, I feel like we need to thank everybody who took the time to share their opinions and comments with the National Park Service relating to its proposed land exchanges for Cumberland Island. That comment period ended right before our trip, and I know we had a lot of a lot of strong representation. Oh yeah, fitting everything right in before the trip. You can read a copy of our organization's final comments on our website, and we'll also link to comments from other conservation organizations as they become available. Yeah, we we found that a lot of individuals and partner organizations shared our concerns, and we're grateful that so many of those groups and people went on the record to share them. I think it was a really important part of the process. If you haven't sent us a copy of your comments, we'd love to see them if you're comfortable sharing. Uh, so be sure to send those over at info at wildcumberland.org. We are, of course, hopeful that the Park Service will put forth maybe an alternative solution that is better aligned with the congressional intent for the seashore. But we'll keep folks updated as we learn more. As we mentioned, immediately after submitting our comments, some of our volunteers grabbed their gear and trekked straight to the island, where we spent time collecting marine debris, hosting new friends, reflecting on the importance of wilderness and primitive recreation, and exploring some new opportunities for uh, some collaboration. Despite the wilderness closure, which we'll talk about here in a minute, we experienced a lot of wildlife during our time together. So we saw much good stuff. Bald eagles, sea turtles. I saw a dolphin come up right next to the ferry and kind of follow us. That was so cool. Saw some gopher tortoise holes, deer, bobcats. There were piping plovers at snakes, multiple kinds of snakes. Um, There were spectacular sunsets, sunrises. I mean, the weather was just fantastic. Dragonflies. So many dragonflies. Thousands. (laughs) uh, You know, these swallow murmurations over the dunes were fantastic to witness. And there were even shooting stars. Oh, yeah, for sure. And of course, we also observed a lot of down trees from Hurricane Helene and or Milton. You know, can't really trace them back to those. But we saw, like I said, a lot of down trees. Also one very sick horse, which was blocking yeah. everything that it could, right? Every campsite <laughs> that we needed to use or enter was blocked by this horse, I think, that day. The water fountain. Yeah, he would <laughs> he would walk under there and just stay, right? I felt uh, really bad for him. I did too, yeah. We also encountered a couple paragliders, the kinds with motors on the back really? on the south end, which was kind of disturbing on those early morning, you know, beach walks and sunrises. Right. But we found a lit campfire when we got to one of our no sites. Way. It was fully engulfed with flames and smoke at noon. Hmm. Um, and, you know, there were, th- we, so we had a lot to observe while we yeah. were there. Before we left, though, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, that we discovered the world's best cinnamon rolls at the new place in St. Mary's, Kraken Coffee and Kitchen. I love that place. I thought people were just, you know, exaggerating. I tasted this thing. 
it's amazing. <laughs> and it, it fully ranks as the best cinnamon roll I think I've ever had in my life. Um, and then we found some new trail snacks, which were really yummy over at Farm to Family. So we had a good time in St. Mary's while we were there and want to encourage our supporters to also visit those businesses when they're coming and going from the seashore. Maybe now's a good time to talk about a little bit what's happening locally in in St. Mary's, right? Yeah, this is big news. We shared an announcement about the St. Mary's waterfront being under new ownership in the November newsletter. And apparently the companies who have acquired these waterfront properties represent a billionaire co-owner of the LA Dodgers. His name is Mark Walter. He's reportedly worth like $6 billion and is supposed to be kind of a low-key down-to-earth guy. But his wealth comes in part from buying regional insurance companies Mm -hmm. and then investing the premiums in higher risk and higher return investments. But he has stakes in things like I don't know, Carvana and Beyond Meat, I think is, is are some of the things that have been reported. But uh, in 2013, Walter purchased White Oak Plantation. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's right over the line in Yulee, Florida. It's a little over 7,000 acres. And since then, it's pretty much closed to public access. So I understand it's being used primarily for conservation and research at this time. But now he's bought in St. Mary's, the old Georgia Power Building, a place called Trolley's Restaurant, uh, Lang Seafood Restaurant, and even a house that's right on East St. Mary Street. So So pretty much that entire waterfront. I mean, I think that the article I read said other than one condominium complex and some buildings owned by the National Park Service, the only building not owned or in negotiations for purchase is the St. Mary Sub Museum. And they're moving that. Yeah, I was about to say they're moving anyway, right? They're moving it anyway. So even the iconic Riverview Hotel, right, where everybody loves to stay when they come and go from the seashore is apparently potentially um, going to be purchased by Walter. So it's interesting. I I didn't realize, but back in 21, we were all sort of spinning from COVID, but he purchased other commercial and historic buildings in Colorado. Hmm. So a similar move there where he sort of bought up an entire historic area. And I'm, I'm curious to see, I think that the media tried hard to sort of ascertain what his intent in the community was, but that's never really been something he's talked about. So I am curious if he will take a similar approach with St. Mary's and just remain quiet and sort of a silent partner or um, what the intentions there are. How do you feel about that? I don't know. You know, it's, it's when you're dealing with private entities purchasing um, historic districts and you know, everything like that. It just kind of makes me question the purpose of it. I just don't know. I mean, only time will tell. So I, I, I can go back and forth on it. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Um, My kids and I were talking about this and I think even they agree that St. Mary's is sort of part of the Cumberland Island experience. Yeah. It's so quaint and sleepy and historical and a destination sort of in and of itself, mm. you know, but it's pretty integral to that more primitive experience, right? You sort of step away, you get off the highway and you sort of are forced to slow down immediately. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that, you know, continues until you actually reach your destination on the island. So I'm curious to see if it will change the character and use of the waterfront in particular. Right. So yeah, time will tell. Of course. I'd like to know what our supporters think about it. Yes. And stay tuned on our website and socials. Of course, we'll um, we'll keep everyone updated on what we hear uh, about future projects concerning that. But if you have opinions, send them. We have that cool speak pipe feature on our website and uh, you can leave us a voice message. We'd love to share your comments with the larger group and offer feedback. Since we're on the topic of small, quiet communities that we kind of hold near and dear to our hearts, we have several longtime supporters in Western North Carolina who were severely impacted by the hurricane season, including our friends at Snake Root Eco Tours. Yeah. Uh, we did a really great podcast um, back a few months ago now where we interviewed our friend Tall Gowton from Snake Root Eco Tours this spring. He is an incredible human. He I really love is. getting to speak with him on the on the podcast and you know he's just so wilderness friendly and, and he's led, he's, he was he's raised led, in that right yeah and he's led guided experiences on Cumberland for years he's been um integral to our work and turning people on to the work that we're doing to protect Cumberland Island so 
we really care about him a lot. Yeah, we provided a link in the newsletter for those of you who would like to follow and support their recovery in North Carolina. So check that out. Thanks. And speaking of storm cleanup, we are sensitive to the fact that Camden County was not hit nearly as hard as parts of the Southeast. Right. But the Cumberland Island Wilderness has remained closed um, since September 25th. And so the date of this recording where it's November 3rd, it's been over 30 days that the Park Service has closed the wilderness there. You may remember that the park closed to the public because of Helene mm-hmm. on the 25th, but then it reopened to day use visitors and Lance and Legacy tours for just like two days. And then it closed again for Milton. Right. And on October 12th, they reopened to, I think, camping, day use, Lands and Legacy tours. Uh, but the trails and campgrounds north of Stafford in particular have remained close to the public. So I did note that the public hunt that is scheduled for a couple of days from now um, appears to still be on in the wilderness. So I'll be curious to see if they let hunters in but kept campers out. Funny enough, we have had someone, a listener, um, send us a voicemail on our website oh, about this same issue. Okay. So let's see what they have to say. Okay. And now it's time to hear questions for the host. So this is my favorite time of year to visit Cumberland Island, but the NPS website says the wilderness and backcountry sites are closed for cleanup. Is this because of the hurricane? What exactly is the extent of the damage? Because I'd love to get back down there as soon as possible. Yeah, Robin, thanks for your question. I think um, we encourage you to to ask those questions directly of the National Park Service. Unfortunately, I, I don't want to answer for them, but mm-hmm. um, we also think that there should be some degree of transparency around the amount of time that this closure might impact users and what cleanup really entails right now. So um, I'm sorry. I hope we've, we've answered that the best we can. Yeah, we, we try to give our uh, our best reasoning surrounding that. But, um, you know, of course, we don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. So I would uh, direct your question directly to the NPS for uh, hopefully a better answer. Now, weirdly, we had some people with reservations um, during this closure that didn't receive any notification or cancellations from recreation.gov, right, related to this closure? Yeah, and it appears you could still book a campsite in wilderness <laughs> through recreation.gov, even though the closure is announced on the National Park Service page. I wanted to point that out to our new superintendent. We submitted an inquiry, of course, to discuss this closure back, I don't know, it's been a couple of weeks now, maybe mid-month, and have not received a response. Mm-hmm. So I hope that's something that she can address for users. But I think, you know, I also have some questions. Yeah. And a lot of the campsites that we saw were, were pretty busy because of the wilderness reservations having to be relocated to Stafford and Seacamp. Yeah. I heard people like showed up Mm -hmm. and checked in and they were like, you can't camp in wilderness. And they offered them sites at either Stafford or Seacamp if they were available. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who didn't want a developed campsite experience. I can't imagine if I had been say in the Okie for a week and then traveled to Cumberland for the last leg of my wilderness experience and was forced to divert to Sea Camp or Stafford. Mm-hmm. That's a very different experience right. for users. And of course, the the language that they're using is, uh, to me, a little confusing uh, coming from a wilderness advocate, right? Yeah, we posted a picture in the newsletter, I think, to help people understand the language they're using. But there are signs, certainly upon arrival, and then at every trailhead, you know, on the island indicating that um, ongoing cleanup and assessments are what have left the wilderness closed. Um, And then the website says that the sites and trails are closed until cleanup is complete. Mm -hmm. That leaves a lot of questions open, right? Why do we feel like we need to clean up wilderness when it's supposed to remain um, natural and wild, right? Yeah, hurricanes certainly aren't new to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's certainly not the first time that the seashore has been impacted. And if the ferry is running, it is difficult to understand. Um, And I hope maybe Superintendent Trenchick can offer some insight. I noticed they were very short-staffed while we were there. Um, But again, I think it goes back to, to your point to some of those fundamental questions about our role in managing those ecosystems and specifically those within a wilderness designation. Um, So it's something we are eager to discuss with her. 
Uh, I was really hoping to get to um, venture into the wilderness because this was my first time staying at Stafford. And uh, I really liked the campsite. I was just hoping that we could venture a, a little further north. Well, and Cumberland is interesting because of its linear nature and the way that the campsites progress. You can still be a day you know, use visitor and access wilderness trails. You mm-hmm. can still be a front country camper and access wilderness trails. You don't have to exclusively camp in wilderness in order to benefit from being able to recreate in that area. So I find it a little disconcerting that it has remained closed for so long. And I'm curious for a timeline on when they hope to reopen and maybe they will be a little more transparent about what cleanup looks mm-hmm. like. Yeah. And of course, we'll keep everyone updated on that. You can always let us know your comments um, if you, you know, just connect with us over social and our website Absolutely. or the speaker pipe that we mentioned earlier yeah. in this, this episode. Now, in related seashore news, uh, Gabby, yeah. our is this little, your new favorite bird? Right, yeah, it is. <laughs> she had a stupendous breeding season and has recently been observed returning to the seashore for winter. Yeah, you got to see and her when I, you were yeah, there, right? Yeah, we get right? to see her when, when we were there. We also saw uh, a few more um, little guys. So we also noted some... Um, comprehensive, I would call them? I think so, yeah. That's pretty dang comprehensive, right? Um, updates to the publicly available data and monitoring for Cumberland Island. Yeah, we link to that in the newsletter so you can delve in and see the frequency and um, reporting that they have available for things like water quality monitoring, some of the things that you know we've been asking questions about for a while. So I'm really pleased uh, to see that they have presented that in a more comprehensive and Same here. easier to understand way and look forward to delving in a little to see how we can better support the seashore. We also provided a cool opportunity and linked to a recent tribute to Cumberland Island and Carol Rutschell in Atlanta Magazine. I don't Such know how I missed article. this. Uh, it was like in August yeah. and I missed it completely somehow. Uh, but Too it was it on. was a nice article about Cumberland and uh, Carol specifically yes. was mentioned in there. And so we provided, I thought that was a good chance for us to provide an opportunity. Um, Carol's birthday is coming up mm-hmm. and we're putting together a special birthday package as a team. And so if there's anybody out there who wants to send a postcard or a card or a note, um, no perishables, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our PO box is linked in the, in the newsletter. It's, um, available and certainly let us know if you need that information, but we would be happy to include your well wishes, birthday wishes to Carol. So and wanted she would, to offer that. She would definitely love to see those as well. Uh, of course, another way to honor Carol Rochelle's birthday is to donate to Wild Cumberland and support our work to keep Cumberland wild. You can do that right on our website at wildcumberland.org. All right. So getting back to some more local-ish news, right? Mm-hmm. We included a link to uh, my very best co-host, <laughs> Jessica, her guest editorial and the supporter report called uh, where she called for protection of the Blake Plateau. So we want to remind everyone to make sure your elected officials know how important this is, this issue is to you, no matter where you live. The article, Jess was great. Aww. I loved it. It came, I could tell it came straight from the heart. Yeah. It was like I was talking face to face with you. Oh, that, that makes article. me feel really. So it was really good. I'm really happy to advocate for protections of our marine area. And I, I think that um, Georgia's coast is an incredible place. And like I said in the article, you can't really separate the marine environment from the terrestrial environment. We're interconnected. So it's all one. Yeah. Right? Starting today, November 1st, though, most vessels out in those marine waters that are 65 feet or longer have to slow down because it's North Atlantic right whale calving season and starting today, officially, actually. Yeah. So, and there's only about, what, 300, uh, over 70? 350, 370, Somewhere something like in that. There. Yeah, there's only uh, uh, 370 North Atlantic right whales remaining and less than 70 females that are still able to reproduce. So, very one low of, numbers, right? One of the most endangered whales in the world, actually. For sure. So everybody slow down. Keep your eyes out. Yes. We also pointed out the Okefenokee expansion plan, which proposes adding approximately 22,000 acres adjacent to the existing refuge. The public can provide input by November 18th via email to okefenokee at fws.gov. There's also a public covenant opportunity. It's only two weeks, I think, November 14th Mm -hmm. through the 29th, related to the development of a mariculture zone slightly north of Cumberland and Camden. So just over the the county line, I think, in Glen. Yeah, we put a picture up on our newsletter so you can see that. It's like 
31 acres in size, but each individual lease is a little over seven and a half acres. And it's pretty close to the Jekyll Causeway, if, you, mm-hmm. if you're familiar with either seeing that from Cumberland or driving it yourself. So I think this would make the third official mariculture zone that Georgia would, would designate. So awesome. make sure you provide your comments if you have concerns or um, objections to that plan. Now, in National Park Service and uh, more national news, I guess, yeah. the Theodore Roosevelt National Park is managing its horse population. Uh, according to our friends at National Parks Traveler, the MPS is removing 15 horses from the park and rounding up the entire 200-strong herd. Uh, helicopters will be used to slowly move the herd into the park's south corrals. The herd will be given health screenings and some individuals will be fitted with GPS collars to monitor range throughout the park. Very different than what we're experiencing on Cumberland. (laughs) Right. Uh, The removal in this park is part of a larger wildlife managing program with 200 bison also being rounded up to be found homes uh, outside the park. Yeah. And I think the 15 horses that are slated for removal are mares who haven't responded to contraceptives Mm -hmm. and their... Uh, descendants, if if I'm not their offspring, if you will, so that they're trying to get a better handle on that. Um, and I think they're donating them to tribes, nonprofits, or they're being auctioned. So wow, very different. Yeah, and of course there have been no recent updates on litigation related to Cumberland Island's feral horse population. Right. So um, I don't know. It seems like a a pretty good roadmap. Um, you know, following their footsteps or maybe gaining some insights. Well, from I think their again, we right? we have to contextualize it, that in other parts of our country, in other parks, they are utilizing a very different type of process to manage those animals. Yeah, something, context. Something that we would uh, maybe love to see our park take into the context as well. Yeah, and then there were some other cool articles before we go. Uh, there was something about the world's tree species. I think they say over thirty percent of them are now at risk of extinction. That's pretty alarming. It is. And then uh, there was a kind of controversial article about climate change destroying communities and mm-hmm. who should have to move, which I find very interesting. Right. And then the Wilderness Society. I don't know where they've been in the southeast recently. Maybe I need to pay more attention. But they did this fancy new interactive map. Uh, if you haven't played with it yet, it's pretty cool. I was testing that out last night. It is a really cool map, though. It gives you um, a lot of information on the wilderness areas in each state. Um, it kind of walks you through a short tour when you first get on there. Dreaming you, like, of something like this down. for years. Right. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool to see um, how effective it is, for sure. One of the things I found really interesting, I guess, maybe even a little scary, between 2011 and 2022, there was a decrease of 10% on average in the amount of stars that people saw across the globe at night. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's scary. I mean, even on Cumberland, though, that's 10 years. You know, you stand there and there's like three distinct areas of sky glow now, Mm -hmm. right? You can see St. Mary's very distinctly. You can see Jekyll and you can see Florida. I mean, it's really bright almost no matter where you're standing on that entire undeveloped, you know, beach. So we, we, but, you know, despite that, we saw some cool stuff while we were there. Yeah. We saw Saw some questionable things too. I don't. The shooting stars really stood out to me, oh, but yeah? we spent a lot of time looking at those. And so we noticed some drone activity, kind of curious. I think so, yeah. That was um, interesting. And we encourage everybody to pay attention when they're out looking because lots of stuff happening in our skies. For sure. Always pay attention. Our grassroots group is comprised entirely of volunteers and our work is powered by individual donations. We hope you will consider making a contribution to help us keep our boots on the ground and continue to participate in relevant conservation and stewardship initiatives. We know how valuable your time is, so thanks for choosing to spend some of it with us. Stay wild. Cumberland is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and all donations are tax deductible. Learn more and take action at wildcumberland.org. The Wild Cumberland podcast is produced by Vertical River and this episode was edited by Greg Cusson.